Church family, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I want to invite you to find your place in the 27th Psalm, Psalm 27. I remember being taught years ago as a young boy in church, if you open your Bible right to the middle, you'll probably land in the Psalms. And this morning we're going to look at Psalm 27 and a couple of verses in this song. The Psalms are songs many of them written by King David of Israel. They contain great emotions from the human authors, but also great Holy Spirit inspired truth from our Lord. Before we look at our passage this morning, I wanna make you aware of a couple of things. One, remember this evening we returned to our discipleship groups, our Bible training and teaching classes on Sunday evening, 5 p.m. So we have a number of classes offered. I'll be continuing my study on Christ and this evening we'll talk about one of the major events from the life of Christ that we sang about already this morning, the ascension. There's also also classes available uh, for women, men. Don Startup's teaching a class on worship. We have a class on the cross. So I encourage you to take advantage of one of those. Also, down this hallway, in the Fellowship Hall entrance, we have a resource table with recommended books. We haven't given much spotlight to that over the last several weeks with our capital campaign or generosity initiative emphasis. But I want to recommend to you this book that's out there called The Power of Prayer. I read it devotionally several years ago. Recently, there was much made about the events at Asbury. This details a revival that took place in New York City in 1858. This is a real encouragement to personal prayer. Most revivals that we document and read of had prayer as a critical element. And so may we be a praying people in our generation. If you have a copy of God's word, I invite you to stand. If you're physically able to honor the reading of God's word, and we're gonna read the entirety of Psalm 27 as this morning we focus on the subject of seeking God. David said, the Lord is my light in my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers came against me to devour my flesh, my foes and my enemies stumbled and fell. Though an army deploys against me, my heart will not be afraid. Though a war breaks out against me, I will still be confident. I've asked one thing from the Lord. It is what I desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. For he will conceal me in his shelter in the day of adversity He will hide me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be high above my enemies around me. I will offer sacrifices in his tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be gracious to me and answer me. My heart says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave or abandon me, God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandoned me, the Lord cares for me. Because of my adversaries, show me your way, Lord, and lead me on a level path. Do not give me over to the will of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing violence. I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Father, we come to you today in the name of your son, Jesus, who has paved a way into your presence through his body and blood through the cross of Calvary. 
Thank you, Spirit of the living God, for your presence in our midst. And thank you for the way that you inspired King David of old to write this song. And Spirit, thank you for truth that is in this song for us this morning. And as we look into your word during this moment of truth, Spirit of the living God, would you instruct us? Would you feed us? Would you encourage us? Would you strengthen your people to know you and to do your will in this world? We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In all generations, the Lord invites his people to seek after him. This morning, I draw our attention to this psalm as on this occasion, we give offerings for a future work for the sake of the gospel. I draw our attention to this psalm to remind us that all of our sacrifices, our investment of our time, talents, and treasures into this church are all for the purpose of knowing the Lord and making him known. This is our aim. For Jesus Christ to be magnified and glorified in the midst of this people, in the midst of this place. David got it. He, he was facing a difficult season. He was on the run and hiding for his life because there were foes who wanted to kill him. In the midst of fleeing and hiding, David composed this song, and in this song we see his focus in the midst of a difficult season. Difficult season seems kind of trite. The man was running for his life. He was staring death in the face. And in the midst of pending doom and possible death, he wrote this song. And this song, though it mentions his enemies, this song gave primary focus to his pursuit of the Lord. His focus, his faith, was in Yahweh, Jehovah, creator God. We have here a, what we could call a trilogy of songs. Many believe Psalm 26, Psalm 27, Psalm 28 were all written together. A trilogy, three, composed together. When I was in high school, one of my prized possessions within my collection of VHS tapes was my Star Wars trilogy, the original. None of that CGI stuff in it. Here we have a trilogy of songs penned by King David of Israel expressing his heart commitment to pursue after the Lord. May we hear the word of the Lord this morning as a people of God called Tabernacle. May we see God's word for us. 21st century America with so much messed up stuff. A nation so confused doesn't know up from down. Even progressing professing Christians have seemed to have forgotten their God and forgotten the simplicity of the gospel and the word of God. May we see from the word of God our need to be a simple people who have hearts set on seeking God. And as we give money and think about building buildings, may we remember the church is never about a place or a building or brick and mortar. The church is for, first and foremost about a humble people of praise existing for the glory of Jesus, seeking God. The question we have this morning is, what's involved in this seeking of God? We've looked at this psalm already in this sermon series on seek. But I want us this morning to circle back around, come back to this passage, and consider three ideas. Three realities involved in an earnest seeking after God. Number one, this morning, I want us to take note of this idea of 
the heart. The heart. Verse 28, David said, my heart says this about you. Seek his face. Notice the source of David's pursuit of the Lord. This thing involves the man's heart. Now what is the heart? The Hebrew word used by David is the Hebrew word lev. It's used elsewhere in the Psalms to speak of the physical entity within the chest of humanity that beats and sends blood throughout the body. In Psalm 38, 10, David used the same Hebrew word used here to speak of the physical mechanism in his heart, in his chest, the heart. That physical muscle is often regarded as being central to human life because it, boom, 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 boom beats and sends blood throughout the body and it's blood that sends life-sustaining nutrients and even oxygenates the body. So the heart is central to our physical constitution and David used this word in Psalm 38, 10 in a physical sense. There he said, my heart races, my strength leaves me. Read the Psalms and you'll find that David often experience what could be called the dark night of the soul. He often experienced anxiety, apprehension, angst, and anger. The Psalms, if nothing else, are an account of David just pouring out his heart in verse to the Lord during the dark nights of his soul. On one occasion, he spoke of his physical heart. Psalm 38, 10, my heart races. Many believe that David was subject at time because of threats around him. He was subject to panic attacks or anxiety. And he knew in those moments to pursue the Lord, to trust in the Lord. Though his physical heart raced, he turned to the Lord. So this word lave is used of the physical heart, but David also employed the term to speak of a non-physical heart. You see, humanity, yes, has a muscle beating inside its chest, but humanity also has a non-physical heart, this spiritual soul nature. Jesus said in John 4, 24, those who worship me should worship me in spirit and in truth. Get it, you're not just a physical being, you are a spiritual being. Yes, you have a material nature, but you have an immaterial nature. Genesis chapter one, we read about how the Lord created all things, and when the Lord created all things, he turned in the last couple days to create living beings. He created the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the animals on the land. And he created all of those beings, the Bible teaches us, as he created other matter, he created those beings by speaking. God is so powerful, he only has to speak and things appear or disappear. Things exist or they don't exist. But when it came time to make man, God, the Bible tells us, took of the dirt of the ground. Why did he take of the dirt of the ground? Well, I don't fully know, but I do know this. When he created man, he created man differently than how he created animals. What does that tell us? We are different, we are distinct than the animal kingdom. We have this thing called a soul. We are spiritual in nature. We have a capacity for an otherworldly supernatural relationship with the living God. And this is what David meant when he used this term heart. He meant to speak of the human soul. Don't believe 
what an atheistic society would teach you, you are different than the animal kingdom. There is an immaterial part to your nature that is made for God. And David here calls it the heart. He uses the heart as a metaphor, why? Because just as the physical heart is central to our physical life, your spiritual heart is central to your spiritual life. I can remember years ago counseling with a man who was a doctor who had fallen in to sin and some spiritual and moral ruin and I spoke to him about his need to address his heart issues and the question was asked, what do you mean my heart? How do I do something spiritually with my physical heart? And I had to clarify, yes, you have a spiritual heart, but you have a, yes, you have a physical heart, but you have a spiritual heart as well. Pay attention to the immaterial part of your human constitution. Richard Sibbs was a Puritan, an English Puritan, and he once said of the heart, the heart is between God and our obedience, as it were, an ambassador. An ambassador. In one of my pastorates, I served in a military town, and because of our proximity to a military base, we had internationals at times visit our church, people from different countries. Many times they were there receiving training from the U.S. Army to go back to their country, which was an ally with the United States, to be more equipped to serve in their country, in their country's military. I can remember traveling on post for one of the first times and I was with the lieutenant colonel and I saw foreign flags hanging from houses in the officer's quarters and I asked, well, what are those flags for? And he said, well, those flags, those foreign flags mark a home of someone who is here from another country representing their country to our United States Army. So we know what an ambassador is. Even this morning as I preach in foreign countries, there are Americans who are deemed ambassadors who are serving on our behalf, representing interest of the United States of America to other countries. Richard Sibbs in this quote used that idea as an example for how your human heart functions in your relationship with the Lord. This is the interface between you and God, your soul, your heart. It's for good reason, years later, David's son Solomon, when he wrote the Proverbs, would say this, Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Hear me this morning as we talk about seeking God, we're not talking about mere man-made religion. We're not talking about mere physical, mechanical stuff. We're not talking about empty ceremony and rituals. We're not talking about human tradition and culture. We're talking about the God of the universe through the spirit of Christ moving in our hearts and making us more like Jesus and using us as witnesses for him in this world. The heart. We need heart transformation. This is what's involved in seeking God. Number two this morning, I want you to note this idea of the anointed one. Oh, this is critical, this is important. There are many spiritual people in our country who, and world who would perhaps agree with a lot of what I've said up to this point. They're all about spiritual stuff. Other world religions would say yes and amen to seeking some conception or idea of God. It's important that we note the basis or the grounds of David's worship. David knew the true path and means to seeking God. 
follow along with me a trail of verses in this trilogy of songs. The man was being oppressed. He had enemies who slandered him and wanted to kill him. And he started his trilogy of songs in verse one of Psalm 26. Look there in your Bible. He prayed and sang, vindicate me, Lord, because I have lived with integrity and have trusted in the Lord without wavering. A song of vindication. He continued in Psalm 21 by saying this, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? Notice, though men pursued him, he had a Godward focused. Oh, be careful, believer. The Bible teaches us the fear of man is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is safe. He went on to sing, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom should I dread? Psalmist David was focused on the Lord. If you turn to Psalm 28, in verse number six, we'll see his emphasis continued. He said in verse six of Psalm 28, the last song in the trilogy, blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the sound of my pleading. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart celebrates, and I give thanks to him with song. Look at verse eight. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is a stronghold of salvation, here's the important phrase, for his anointed. Everybody say that word, anointed. This is a really important word. In fact, you could say the Hebrew word found here within the original Hebrew of Psalm 28 is at the center of all of scripture. The word translated anointed is like a hub at the center of all of the storyline of scripture. This word translated anointed is at the center. It is the crux of our very salvation. This word translated anointed represents the pathway we have to pursuing God and seeking God. The word translated anointed here is the one that's often used in scripture for Messiah. We could translate what David said here as anointed one. David and all of his praying, David and all of his anxiety, David and all of his worship, David and all of his fear, David and all of his praise had his eyes not on mere men, David, in all of his praying, had his eyes not on himself. David, in all of his praying, had his eyes on the Messiah, the anointed one. Who is the anointed one? Go back to the very first pages of scripture when Adam and Eve, real humans, sinned and rebelled against God. God announced, because you've sinned, you'll experience spiritual death. In fact, when he announced it, they had already experienced spiritual death. Because of the first human sin, sin and death spread like a pandemic to all of humanity. And as a result, all of humankind, every human ever born apart from Jesus Christ is subject to sin and death. But in the midst of Adam and Eve's sin, God gave a great promise. He promised an anointed one, a deliverer, the promised one who would come to trample Satan's sin and death underneath his feet. And the entire storyline of scripture is about the Lord providing that anointed one, Jesus Christ, to live and to die for sins. Shortly after the Garden of Eden, God called a pagan moon worshiper named Abraham. He said, Abraham, with you I'm gonna start a new nation and I'm gonna deliver the deliverer to humankind and to earth. Abraham believed and trusted in God and as a result of him trusting in the Lord's promise, the Lord justified the man. That is, he forgave him of all of his sins and made him righteous. 
Abraham was saved as we are saved by trusting in the promise of the delivered one. Later, through Abraham's lineage, the Lord appeared to this very man, David, king of Israel. David desired to build a great tabernacle for the Lord, a great temple for the Lord. The Lord said, I'm not gonna use you to do that. You've been a man of war in my plan, a man of blood in my plan. I'm gonna use your son to build that temple. Although your son will be the one to build the temple, I've got a promise for you though. Your seed, your lineage will never die. There will forever be a son of David ruling on the earth. He told him in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. We know this was ultimately a promise that Jesus will one day rule upon the earth and the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever. The one who comes from the line of David will in the future literally rule on Garden of Eden part two here on the earth when the Lord makes all things new. But with the promises of David's seed, there was a promise that he would first Messiah, anointed one, be, Daniel 9, cut off. Why did Messiah, why did one of David's seed, the one of David's seed, first have to be cut off? Because we all deserve to be cut off from God because of our sins. But Jesus at the cruel cross of Calvary was cut off on our behalf. We needed a human substitute. We needed a human go-between. We needed the God-man to pay the penalty our sins deserves, and Jesus did that. Now David knew all of these promises. David, as he wrote this trilogy of songs, was overcome with fear and apprehension and anxiety. But all of a sudden, in the midst of his praying, he remembered the promises of God. I mean, he's praying, Lord, they're gonna kill me. Lord, they're gonna take my life. And then it's like in the midst of his praying, a light bulb went off. The Holy Spirit reminded him, you've got nothing to be afraid of. It's been promised to you that your line will never be wiped out. And so David had confidence in the midst of his praying, not because he imagined a way he could outrun his enemies. David had confidence in the midst of his praying because he looked to Christ, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so it is for us, as we seek to draw near to God, our confidence isn't in the flesh. Our hope isn't in our pocketbooks, the intelligentsia here at Tabernacle, our wits, our smarts, our ingenuity. Our hope isn't in our programming, our buildings, our preaching or our teaching. Our hope is in the cross. Our hope is in the God-man. Our hope is in Christ and his glorious good news, his gospel. For this is the power of God unto salvation, the good news that Jesus died for sinners. On top of this, as we seek God, we have to remember that this is our pathway to the Lord. Our pathway to the Lord is not mere man-made religion. Our pathway to the Lord isn't our flesh and what we can do. We are able to address the Lord and call out to him in prayer. We are able to worship the Lord because Jesus has paid for all of our sins and he has paved a highway of holiness right in to the holy of holies. And through Jesus, when we pray, the Lord hears, the Lord answers, the Lord responds. 
We have hope and faith in these things. In this person, Christ, his cross. I like sports. I like watching sports and I like going to games. I've got a lifetime goal to visit every Major League Baseball stadium. I've been to 20 up to this point. I'm not going to ask you to pray that I'd reach 30, but maybe think about it. There's, only, there's one thing I've only been able to do once in a sporting event. I've only got to sit in like that VIP club box. You know what I'm talking about? Y'all ever watch the game and they show the people sitting behind glass? It's that little ring between the, the two bowls normally in a or arena or stadium. And they'll show like the rich people in there hanging out. I got invited once to go in one of those boxes. And I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't see much of the game because there's so much good food in the buffet. I was like back there eating like, y'all enjoy the game. <laughs> but I was given a pass for this thing, you know, and I'd always wanted to do this. I've been there before at the arena. When you walk in, you know, there's the escalators that go up to this nice area. And normally, you know, if you try to go that, what are you doing? Excuse me. Do you have credentials? You know, but I had the pass this time. So I just said, there you go, huh? Now, oh, by all means, go up the escalator. So I'm walking up the escalator. And then you go to where you check in and it's glass. It looks like you're walking into this fancy office. And um, I'm sorry, sir, did you, uh, were you lost? No, no, I've got credentials. If you'll let me in, please. And then you went to your very own door and opened it up and you're there like living room environment. All access pass. Know this believer, you never have to be overcome with fear, anxiety, through Jesus, you always have all access privileges to the presence of God. This is our hope. This is our confidence. This is our pathway to the presence of the Lord, Jesus Christ. So may we talk about him often. May we preach him often. May we teach him often. May his name be on our lips. May his cross be in our mind. May he be central to everything we do here. The anointed one. Third and lastly, I would draw your attention to what I would call an invitation. Notice David's words in verse eight. He says, my heart says this about you. Seek his face. Now, ancient Hebrew used in the Bible, especially in the Proverbs and Psalms, is really hard for those who now study Hebrew. That's why if you compare Bible translations, you often see just really stark differences between different translations, renderings of especially the Proverbs and the Psalms. This is a passage that's debated a lot. It's debated whether or not the verse should read the Lord says this, seek his face, or my heart says this, seek his face. You follow? So the question is, who's talking to David's heart here? Is it God talking to David's heart, saying, seek my face, or is it David preaching to himself, telling his heart, seek the Lord's face? Well, Debates may go on about that until the Lord appears and maybe we can ask David at that point, what did you mean to say there? We do know this, the language is really forceful and the Hebrew David uses in essence what is a command in our original language. So this is like forceful, almost military-like language whether it's David talking to himself or the Lord talking to David, there is a command, seek the Lord's face. And maybe that's the only meaning we really need to take away from it. There's times where we need to talk to ourselves and take ourselves in hands, as D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says in Spiritual Depression. There's times where we need to tell ourselves the truth. Lloyd-Jones teaches about that in his book, Spiritual Depression. We know also that the Lord always extends an open invitation for us to seek him. James 4 tells us, draw near to the Lord and he'll draw near to you. 
Jesus summoned us. Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And later in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, he would say, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give rest for your souls. So whatever the meaning here, we can walk away and say, yes, both are true. We're to tell ourselves to seek the Lord and the Lord invites us to seek him. What we need to see is the command, however, God's word calls us to seek the Lord. I go back to Richard Sibbs, that Puritan. He said, God is willing to be known. Know this believer at Tabernacle, 21st century society. This is God's nature. Open invitation. Creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who made all things and lives somewhere out there beyond the galaxies. He extends an open invitation for you to seek him. Sib said, the Lord is willing to open and discover himself. That's an old way of saying, he'll reveal himself to you. God delights not to hide himself. So as we think about the future of our church and on this special Sunday, First Fruit Sunday, May we remember why we exist. We exist to know the Lord, to make him known, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. There stands an open invitation to seek the Lord. And Jesus desires worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. From the soul, worshiping him. And the Lord desires a people through his son, to praise him, to glorify him, to make him known in this world.